Why is extreme violence, which we would like to be unimaginable, actually the opposite? Not only imagined, but regularly carried out. That's the question that led Joshua Oppenheimer, one of the directors of The Act of Killing, to their subject. A 1965 genocide in Indonesia and Anwar Congo, one of the small-time gangsters turned brutal mass murderers, who in their film claims to have killed 1,000 Marxists himself. This extraordinary new film, which is executive produced by not only documentary giant Errol Morris, but also Werner Herzog, is coming to art houses across the states this summer. I'm very glad it brings Joshua Oppenheimer to Grit TV. Joshua, welcome. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. You call it, I think, a um, cinematic fever dream. That seems about right. Yeah, or an observational documentary of the imagination. Um, the film involves former death squad leaders who were recruited by the Indonesian army in 1965 to help execute somewhere between half a million and two and a half million enemies of the new right-wing military dictatorship of General Suharto. And these men did it and have remained in pow positions of power ever since. And so when you, I met them, instead of denying what they've done or apologizing for it as perpetrators normally do in documentary, instead they boast they appear to be proud of what they've done. They're eager to show me what they've done, to take me to the places where they've killed, and to understand essentially why they're boasting, how they want to be seen, how they maybe really see themselves, and the nature of the whole regime of impunity built on mass graves. I give them the chance to dramatize what they've done in whatever ways they wish, and the act of killing is the result. Just remind us, this 1965 killing, a lot of people haven't even heard of it. What happened to the perpetrators? Uh, and what about that paramilitary organization that you referred to? Is it still around? Yeah, so the army outsourced a lot of its dirty work to paramilitary death squads, civilian death squads, which were drawn from different paramilitary groups. One of them was called Panchasila Youth. It's now one of the most powerful right-wing paramilitary organizations in Indonesia. In the film, you can see the head of the organization, a man named Yapto. You also you see the vice president of Indonesia dressing up in their Panchasila youth's camouflage fatigues, addressing a congress of Panchasila youth members, saying, we need our gangsters because we need to be able to beat people up. Now, this man, this vice president, is not only making a, trying to make a bid for Indonesia's presidency next year, he's also the current head of Indonesia's Red Cross. The people that we're watching, do they think they're making something that will glorify them, one of the westerns or Hollywood movies that they grow up watching and talk about the influence on? 
I don't think so. I think that, in fact, the main character in the film, Anwar Congo, is actually, and perhaps this is why I lingered on him, actually using the film to somehow deal with his own pain. Um, to either run away from it, to, to somehow tame the miasmic horror that visits him in his nightmares with these relatively contained cinematic reconstructions, or perhaps to probe it as we are, as we do when we've been through a trauma. I, you know, there's a very striking moment in the film where Adi, the other surviving member of Anwar's gangster, uh, of Anwar's death squad and fellow gangster, warns everybody, look, don't make this film. It's going to turn the whole story on its head. It's going to re allow Indonesians to see the truth and say the truth, which is namely that the killings were wrong, that it wasn't glorious, and that on the basis of it, this whole regime of fear and impunity was constructed. He warns Anwar to stop, and Anwar keeps going, I think because he doesn't care. He's not trying to look good. He's trying to deal with his pain. And I think all the younger thugs in the film, the protégés of the killers, the members of this three million strong right-wing paramilitary movement, they also keep going happily because somehow as gangsters, their capital, if you like, is, their fe is fear. They are able to go around marketplaces in Indonesia, extort the relatives of the victims, steal their land, for no other reason apart from the fact that they're feared. And there is another person in the film who is very concerned that it be clear that they were the cruel ones. That in fact the paramilitaries, the gangsters, were the cruel ones, not anybody else. Well in fact that's Adi, that's the very same person who warns Anwar that so he, he shouldn't himself make this is sort of ambivalent. Well, yeah, I think he goes through this extraordinary arc in the process of shooting work. He comes in saying all the things that, in a way, I was dying for somebody to say. I was filming there for five years by that point. I was dying for somebody to come in and say, this was wrong. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. Here comes a perpetrator, no less than the other member of Anwar's death squad, coming in saying this was wrong, the government should apologize, all the propaganda about it is a lie, there should be truth and reconciliation, and so forth. And I took that at face value, and I introduced him to Anwar, expecting, wondering what, this, what effect this will have, perfectly prepared for this to totally change the course because of the production. Because he says, what, will the, what must the children think? The kids are the people that we killed. Surely this will even more turn them against us. They might come after us. But then later he says this other thing. Yeah, well, I think what he's doing by coming into the film and saying all these things is not really, is not really being progressive, but showing off. Mm -hmm. Showing to the other thugs, look, I'm so strong that I can know it was wrong, tell myself it was wrong, and still sleep easily at night still sleep without nightmares. One of the things that Anwar Congo himself cannot do. Exactly. I, sometimes people will see the film and, and, and maybe in their own effort, and this is a minority of my audience, but people say, will say, oh, I'm not like that. These men are psychopaths. Well, of course, the textbook definition of a psychopath is someone incapable of empathy. And Anwar's problem, precisely, is that he's not a psychopath, mm -hmm. that he's haunted by what he's done. And it would be so much easier for him if he were. Is this film, does it stand any chance of being seen in Indonesia? Yeah, the, Indonesia bans films, and in particular they ban films dealing with human rights violations. So if they ban the act of killing, we knew that if we submitted it to the censors right when we finished the film, before there was any Indo Indo Indonesian support for the film, they would ban it. And if they ban it, it becomes a crime to screen the film. And if it's a crime to screen the film, that's an excuse for the paramilitaries or for the army itself to attack screenings physically and with impunity. So to avoid that, we held screenings all last autumn at the National Human Rights Commission in Jakarta. We invited Indonesia's leading journalists, news producers, news publishers, filmmakers, historians, educators, human rights advocates, survivors organizations to see the film. And they all really loved the film. Indonesia's media felt we, after this film, we cannot remain silent anymore about what happened. And they broke, in a pretty spectacular way, a 47-year silence on the genocide and started to really report it as a, as a crime against humanity. Indonesia's leading news magazine, kind of the equivalent of Time, published a, a special double edition of the magazine, kind of the Act of Killing edition, on the 1st of October last year, with 75 pages of boastful testimony from perpetrators all around the country showing that the film is showing is exposing a systemic problem. And yet, Anwar Congo, what's happened to him? Anwar is then presented not as a kind of 
the mascot for the genocide, but one of potentially 10,000 perpetrators who've had impunity. All these people who we showed the film to last autumn then went back to their networks and started screening the film. So on the 10th of December last year, we had the premiere. That was International Human, Human Rights, Rights Day. Day. There were 50 screenings in 30 cities. That's ranging in size from 30 to 600 people. That's grown ever since. So now, uh, as of April 1st, there were 500 screenings, screenings getting bigger each time. But I'm not hearing prosecutions. 95 cities. So I think that the Indonesian human rights community as a whole is now demanding a presidential apology, a truth, and a truth commission, a reconciliation process, and tribunals for the leading uh, commanders of this. That could include, there's a newspaper boss in the film who says that his role as a newspaper boss was to make the people hate the communists and to also he would give names of people and order them executed. But nobody in the human rights community in Indonesia is suggesting that people like Anwar, of which there let's say are 10,000 across Indonesia, should be put on trial because although he is the main perpetrator in the film, I think there's a sense that Indonesia needs to needs to return these kind of acts, that the purpose of justice would be to return genocide, mass killing, to the realm of the forbidden, expose what happened, rehabilitate the survivors who've been blamed ever since, and then open a space for fighting against corruption, the use of gangsters in politics, and and moving forward so these things can't happen again. We've talked about Indonesia and individuals in Indonesia. What about the U.S. role? The first thing we have to remember is that the 1965 genocide, the dictatorship, the Suharto dictatorship which followed, the regime in which gangsters can be used by corporations as well as politicians to break strikes, to seize land, the, 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 the horrifying moral universe that you see in the act of killing, that is the West's vision for Indonesia. And what the U.S. the U.S. was involved at the time in supporting the killings with money, with radios so that they could coordinate their actions, with weapons, with black propaganda, and fundamentally, yeah, you can't say the U.S. was the ringmaster in all of this, but the U.S. played a supportive role and supported that regime throughout its its uh, until today, including when it invaded East Timor and the subsequent killing of a third of East Timor's population, ongoing killings in West Papua and killings throughout, throughout the country. You can't help, well I couldn't help but wonder as I watched it, two things. One, what was your, what you were going through watching these acts be described and acted out. But then secondly, what you took away or maybe what you want us to take away in terms of our own self-reflection on our own you call Indonesia a country where the killers have won. On our own country, where the killers, in so many instances, have won, whether you're talking about the history of slavery or genocide of Native Americans, certainly in big strokes, the killers here, too, have won. And if that's a pathological society, surely, to some extent, ours is also. Absolutely. I mean, I, people will sometimes ask me, and this sort of dovetails with your question, didn't you ever want to get away from there? Didn't you want to escape? Didn't you want to go home? and leave. And I really, you know, I started this process working in a community of plantation workers and they were struggling to organize a union and it turned out they were survivors of the killings. And they were trying to organize, they were working for a Belgian plantation company making oil palm, a uh, palm oil, harvesting oil palm. And they were spraying a herbicide, a poison, which was to the women workers, which was dissolving their livers and killing them in their 40s. And they were struggling to organize a union so that they would be able to not use this poison and get which the Belgian company was making them use and you know this their, their biggest obstacle was fear and because the perpetrators had won and been in power ever since and I recognize from that experience that there is no there was nowhere for me to go home to that every object touching my body right now every article of clothing is haunted by the suffering of the people who make it for us mm -hmm. And all of them, without exception, are working in places where there's been mass political violence, where perpetrators have won, and have, often with the complicity of the U.S., have kept people afraid, so afraid that the human cost of everything we buy is not included in the price tag that we pay for it. And in that sense, we in the U.S. depend on Anwar and his friends for our everyday living. This is not a distant reality which where black is white and white is black on the other side of the world. This is the underbelly of our reality. 
And in that sense, it's not the exception to the rule. As you rightly pointed out, it is the rule. Almost all of our societies, whether it's the British Empire or the twin holocausts of, the, of American, Native American genocide or slavery, all of our, and then segregation, all of our societies are built on violence where perpetrators win and write their own history, as Adi says in the film. And I think that I made the, the very first perpetrator I filmed took me down to a river bank where he showed me how he would cut off heads, the heads of busloads of people delivered to him by the army every night and dump them in the river. And after he and his fellow death squad member showed me this, he pulled out a little point and shoot stills camera and asked my sound recorders to take pictures of them posing with the river flowing behind them while they gave the thumbs up and the V for victory. And this was in February 2004. I went back to London, where I was living at the time, worked through this horrific footage, and in April 2004, still very much haunted by this footage, photographs of American soldiers in Iraq come out, American soldiers giving the thumbs up and the V for victory while torturing and humiliating people. At Abu Ghraib. And in Abu Ghraib. And the question raised by those photographs is not so much the crimes that they document, but the moral and cultural and political vacuum in which those photographs bear happy memories for the person in them. Why would you want to hold that photograph as a memento of that moment? Joshua Oppenheimer, thanks so much for coming in and thank you for your film. Thank you so much for having me.